Wasn't that precious? Thank you, Danny and Arlene. Thank you so much. Boy, that was great. I want to thank uh, Dave and Marguerite for reading the scriptures. And Justin, I really learned a lot about the Bible today. (laughs) I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. And God is a good God, isn't he? You learn all the time. But he taught a good lesson, and that is, don't believe everything you hear, even if it comes from the pulpit. Uh, Verify it, document it, search the scriptures. Be sure you prove all things. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, this morning we come to you because of our great need, because of our deep longing to be one with you, to have that bonding spirit where we have your mind in us, your will in us. Lord, we are so human, and we are so weak, and we are so ignorant. We need you. We need your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, have mercy. Please, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we might know you and be one with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. About 15 years before the Civil War, in 1847, Samuel B. Morse patented uh, the telegraph. He also partnered with a fellow by the name of Alfred Vail in creating the Morse Code. The Morse Code was a sequence of short and long electrical pulses, commonly known as dots and dashes, to represent letters, numbers, punctuation marks, in order to structure and formulate a message. It was the first and fastest method of long-distance communication. As a result, As it began to mushroom, it needed more and more workers. So, one company decided that they were going to put an ad in the newspapers for a Morse code operator. And a young man picked up the paper, read the ad, and decided that he was going to go to the office and apply. He came into the office. The office was noisy. It was filled with clutter, including the sound of a telegraph operating in the background. And it seemed like it was busy and noisy and and very distracting. And so he went into this office And as he came to the reception desk, there was a sign. And the sign said, take an application form, fill it out, and then just wait to be summons in to the inner office for the interview. One man came in. He went to the reception desk, took out the application form, filled it out, and then he just sat and waited to be called. Another man came in, took the application form, filled it out, and sat down and waited, waited to be summoned, to be called. A third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh man came in. 
They all filled out the application form and they all sat down in the waiting room, waiting to be called. Then all of a sudden, an eighth man comes in. He goes to the reception desk. He reads the sign. Take an application form, fill it out, sit down and wait to be summons. And so he took the application form, filled it out, sat down with the rest of the seven applicants. And then after a few minutes, got up and walked straight into the inner room. The other applicants <laughs> looked at him and thought, he had lost it because they hadn't heard anybody calling out a summons to come into the inner room. And uh, um, they started wondering what was going to happen with this young man who went in the other room. But after a few minutes, the employer came out, and he escorted the young man out of the office and said to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has just been filled. The other applicants began to grumble one to another. And then one of them got enough courage to to confront the employer and said, now wait a second, wait a second. He was the last one here. And we were here before him. And we were waiting to be interviewed. How come he got the job and we didn't? We didn't even get a chance to be interviewed. That's not fair. That's not fair. The employer said, well, I'm sorry, but all the time that you were sitting here, the telegraph had been ticking out the following message in Morse code. And it gave a message, and then at the end of the message it said, if you understand this message, then come right on, come right on in, the job is yours. None of you heard it, and none of you understood it. This man did, and he's got the job. We live in a world where there's so much going on, so much activity, so much noise, noise in the world, noise in art economical sector, noise in our family, noise in our school, noise in our church, noise, just a lot of noise. And it's distracting sometimes. And sometimes when it's distracting, sometimes we can't hear what God is trying to say to us and reveal to us his will. Ellen White makes the statement, and it's found in the back of your bulletin. It's the middle, it's the middle quotation. And you won't find this in, in, in her uh, publications, but it's, it was written on the front of her old Bible in her own handwriting. And she says, pray till prayer makes you forget your own wishes or leaves or merges it into God's will. The divine wisdom has given us prayer not as a means to obtain the good things of earth, but as a means whereby we learn to do without them. Not as a means to escape evil, but as a means whereby we become strong to meet it. God has given us his word, his presence, his opportunity to talk to him and pray with him as a means 
whereby we become one with Him, one mind with Him, where our will merges with His will. That is the ultimate objective of the plan of redemption. She goes on in this next quotation. In the smallest as well as the largest matters, the first great question is what is God's will in this matter? For his will is to be our will. Now, how do you find out what God's will is? How do we know God's will? How do we understand the mind of God? Generally, you know, we all have our stereotyped answers. The Bible. Well, that's true. The Bible does reveal the, the mind of God, the will of God. Psalms 119 and 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is a revelation of his character in different circumstances, different situations, in different times. That is true. And we are rightly to divide the word of truth in order to understand it. We're to analyze it, not just take one text and say, this is God's will. No, that's not to develop a deep theological understanding of God. But the scriptures is our base. Providential circumstances is another source of understanding God's ways and God's will, circumstances. God sometimes opened doors, and then sometimes God closes doors. He goes before us. He is the good shepherd. In Romans 8, 16, we have the impressions and the convictions of the Holy Spirit working in us. And we talk about conscience. Conscience is subjective and relative. There's a good conscience, conscience. There's an evil one. There's a seared one. So conscience isn't an absolute like the scriptures is more absolute. Then you have the counsel of spiritual people. In Ephesians 4, God said that he gave the church some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. God gave the churches certain gifts and God works through these individuals just like Jethro counseling Moses. And then there are signs. Sometimes God gives us indications, signs. But in all of these ways, all of these ways have to harmonize. They have to be in alignment with one another. If God impresses you to do something, and if it doesn't coincide with the scriptures or with providential circumstances, then you need to wait until it's clear and not to run impulsively. Sometimes God reveals his will, but he tells us wait. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, God told Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. Abraham was 75 years of age. But the timing didn't materialize until he was 100, 25 years later. Abraham had to wait 25 years. And of course, you know the story of the ways that God reveals his will we talked about the counsel of spiritual people. Now, it was good that Justin gave us that children's story because you need to document and verify 
and prove all things. Amen. You remember when King Rehoboam took the throne after King Solomon died. King Rehoboam asked his counselors, he asked some of the older counselors what he should do. They gave him some counsel. Then he asked some of the younger counselors what he should do. And he took the advice of some of the younger counselors. And what happened? The nation of Israel split. You remember Ahithophel. Ahithophel was a counselor of King David. And if you read the Bible, his counsel, according to the Bible, was like the counsel of God. He was so revered, but yet when Absalom rebelled, he went and he counseled Absalom. And he, of course, had some, he had, he had a problem because King David uh, had um, taken his granddaughter Bathsheba and, and his grandson, uh, the first child of Bathsheba, died. And he kind of resented what he did to Bathsheba. So he had some personal feelings that skewed his counsel to Absalom. But you remember the end result. Absalom died and Ahithophel committed suicide. Now, you also have the story in 1 Kings 13, the story of the old prophet and the, new, and the young prophet and how that all ended up. And when you read the scriptures and you, and, and, and you take all of these examples, it tells you that you can't put your trust in the human element. You just can't. You've got to put your trust in, in God. He's the only one. Sometimes we ask for signs because life is confusing and we want something clear cut. And sometimes we don't know where to go. And so in desperation, we ask for signs. I'm reminded of a story that appeared in Reader's Digest of a flight attendant that decided she was going to take a week's vacation and go to the Rocky Mountains. And she was captivated by the mountain peaks, by the clear blue skies, by the sweet smelling pines. And she was just enamored with the beauty of nature. And nature is tranquilizing. It's reinvigorating. And she just loved it. And, 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 but, but, but one thing that also caught her attention was a very eligible bachelor who uh, had a cattle ranch. And he lived in a log cabin. Well, she spent the week there in the Rockies, in nature, and she was enjoying the new relationship. And at the end of the week, she tells the cattle rancher, well, I'm going to have to be going back home now. And he, in desperation, not wanting to lose an opportunity, proposes marriage. She is taken back by it because this kind of came rather sudden after only a week. And so she tells him, I need a little time to think about it and to pray about it. Let me go home and uh, I'll get back to you. Well, she went home. The next day in flight, she uh, decided that she needed to um, relax a little bit and perk up a little bit. And so she went into the restroom and she wanted to get a little cool water thrown at her face. And just as she was in the restroom, there was turbulence in the air and the plane started to make uh, gyrating motions. And um, there was a sign that lit up in the restroom 
please return to the cabin. And she took it as a sign of God (laughs) to go back to the Rockies and to marry that cattle rancher. Well, now there are times, there are times that God does give signs, that God does give signs to reveal his will. You remember Gideon and the fleece, the ephod on the high priest with the Urim and the Thummim, Joshua and the sun standing still, Hezekiah asking for the sun's shadow to go backwards 10 degrees. All of these are biblical. And God works through these things. (laughs) You remember even the casting of the lots. Do you remember that Justin was reading about Joshua and how they cast lots to, I I mean, um, (laughs) Jonah. (laughs) You're going to learn new things about the Bible today. (laughs) How Jonah was, was in the ship and they wanted to identify who the culprit was and so they cast lots. And do you remember the disciples in the upper room, when they needed to pick out a replacement for Judas, what did they do? They cast lots. Now, ordinarily, ordinarily, that's not the way that God generally speaks to us and reveals his will. But he does work that way. He does, it's biblical. However, that's not the general way he does it. There's other factors to consider when you think about trying to understand what God's will is. God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. Man has free will. Man has a choice. And there's a dynamic tension that always exists between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Generally speaking, generally speaking, God respects your free will, your power of choice. But there are times in the Bible, where God just won't take no for an answer. And he'll force an issue. For instance, you remember Moses, when he was in the burning bush? God told Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. Moses started giving all kinds of excuses, all kinds of arguments as to why he couldn't go back to Egypt and free the children of Israel. God didn't hear it. He said, go. And Moses went. You remember Pharaoh. Pharaoh was told that the will of God was to release the people. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God had to use 10 plagues to force the issue. He wasn't going to take Pharaoh's free will for an answer. Force the issue. And then he went uh, um, to the Red Sea to pursue the children of Israel, and he died. You remember Balaam. God told Balaam not to go to curse Israel, but he went on three different mountaintops, and instead of cursing them, he blessed them. But it was uh, a resistance. God wouldn't accept it. And of course, Jonah going to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. And he went the other way. God didn't accept Jonah's free will. He forced the issue. 
And Jonah, poor Jonah, thought he was dying in the belly of the whale for those three days. If you read the prayer, he, th- he, he thinks that he's in the grave. He's had a near-death experience, the poor fella. God wouldn't take no for an answer. He wouldn't accept Jonah's free will. So there are times... Now, generally speaking, God does accept your choice. He works with you. But then there are some times that he will not. He'll say no, and he'll force the issue. But then there are other times when you have a distinction between God's preferred will, God's ideal will, with God's permissive will. You find this in numerous occasions in the Bible. You remember in Numbers chapter 11, the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and God provided for them manna. They didn't want manna. They wanted quail. And so God gave them quail. God gave them quail for a month until it was coming out of their ears, the Bible says. And then they got sick, and many died. In Numbers chapter 14, we have the story of just as the children of Israel are outside of the promised land, God tells them, to get 12 individuals from each tribe and go into the promised land and search the land. 12 individuals go and they search the land for 40 days. They come back. Caleb and Joshua say to Moses and the people, this land is abundant. It's rich. This is fantastic. It's flowing with milk and honey. Let's go. Let's seize it. Let's possess it. But the majority, 10 of them, and now wait a second, let's not be too hasty. There are giants in the land, and the walls of the city are huge. I mean, look at the obstacles, look at the problems, look at the difficulties, look at the barriers. Don't make any rash judgments. And pretty soon the 10 had convinced the entire multitude that it was an impossible task. If you read Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, you'll read, and so all the congregation, that's two and a half million people, lifted up their voices and cried, and they wept all night long, crying all night long. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims Wouldn't it be better that we return to Egypt? And so they said to one another, let's select another leader and let's return to Egypt. Now, if you just go on to verse 26, you find out what God does. Here the people are looking at problems. They're looking at obstacles, and they're saying, I wish we could just die in this wilderness. That's what they were praying for. Look at verse 26. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel made against me. I want you to notice, God took it personal. God took it personal. And he said to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you the the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except Caleb and Joshua. They will enter into the land which I swore that I would make you dwell in. I want you to notice the reason why the majority of the children of Israel who left Egypt, didn't go to the promised land, was because they asked God not to go to the promised land. They said it would have been better for us to die in this wilderness, and God gave them what they prayed for. Another incident is in 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 through 9. The people, the people were not happy with the situation with the judges, Samuel was getting older, and his sons were not doing what was right. And so they came to Samuel, and they said to Samuel, we want a king. We want a king just like all the other nations, and God gave him a king. And then you remember the story, what happened to the children of Israel. Right after that, they divided. Ten tribes went to the north, to Syria, and the Assyrians scattered them. In 722, and then the other two remaining tribes in Judah were taken by a Babylonian captivity in 606 BC. But I want you to notice in 1 Samuel 8 7, God took it personally. He said, They haven't rejected you, Samuel, they've rejected me in asking for a king. Do you remember King Hezekiah was sick? He was sick unto death, he was going to die. The prophet Isaiah comes in and he says to King Hezekiah, look, you're sick, you're mortally sick, you're going to die. Prepare your house. Get everything and make it in order. King Hezekiah says, no, I don't want to die. Please pray for me. I'm going to pray. You pray. I don't want to die. I want to live. He prays. Isaiah prays. And lo and behold, God responds. And he heals him and he gives him 15 more years. 15 more years. During that time, he gives, he and his wife give birth to a son called Manasseh. And Manasseh was the most evil king in Israel. He introduced spiritualism and demon possession all of that in Israel. He ruled the longest, 55 years of all the kings. He's the longest reigning monarch in Israel. And if you read the scriptures in 2 Kings 21, verses 10 through 18, the Babylonian captivity was the result of Manasseh's sins. Manasseh should have never been born He should have never been born. But King Hezekiah didn't want to die. And he prayed. God answered his prayers. And they experienced the consequences. You remember God's people during the time of Christ. They wanted a political Messiah. They didn't want a spiritual Messiah. They wanted someone who had the means and wherewithal to start a revolution and to start an insurrection and to revolt against the Roman Empire and give them their independence. They didn't want another nation to occupy Israel. They wanted their freedom just like in the times of King David and Solomon. They wanted to rule. 
You remember when Pilate took the case during, during, uh, before the crucifixion. Pilate had two prisoners. He had Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And then he had a guy by the name of Barabbas. Now, if you read Luke, Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He started a political revolt, and he was a murderer. But what's interesting is, if you read the fourth edition of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, it goes into some of the old documents, the old manuscripts, and it has as a textual variant for Matthew 27, verses 16 and 17. And it says that Barabbas' first name was Jesus. Now, I want you to note, here was Pilate, and he was bringing two people before the people to make a choice. He said, choose Jesus Barabbas, now remember, Jesus Bar Abbas. Bar is son of Abba, father. Daddy, son of daddy. Jesus, son of daddy. Or Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. He said, choose. And naturally, they chose. They chose a political leader. And of course, it was not long after that that God went to the Gentiles to accomplish his ultimate purposes. So you have in the scriptures instances that sometimes God says no, and he forces his will. And sometimes God says, okay, I'll give you what you want, even though it's not for your good. I'll give it to you. You want it? You'll get it. And so you have a God who is dynamic, a God who is sovereign, a God who you can't put in a pigeonhole. You can't stereotype a God who is God and who will do as he pleases because he knows the end from the beginning. And he always does what is good. He always allows what is good. Well, now that's the way God reveals himself. God reveals himself through many ways. And God works sometimes through his preferred will and sometimes through his permissive will. But what's the key? What's our response? I believe that Dave and Marguerite read uh, the key when they read the scripture reading. You notice in John 7, 17, it says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know the doctrine. If you have a heart that's willing to be open, that's willing to be surrendered, that's willing to be emptied, and if you're willing to be willing, no matter what the cost, even your life, then God will reveal his will. In John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in me and in my word, you are my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free Amen. if you abide in me. 
In John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep are known of me. If you really want to know God's will for your life, you have to have a mindset of being wholeheartedly surrendered, wholeheartedly surrendered, and pray like Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, this is my preference. This is what I would like, but nevertheless, let thy will be done. A Native American was visiting New York City with a friend, and they were walking in Times Square in Manhattan during busy rush hour. And they were hearing all of the noises of the city. And if you've ever been to New York City, you know how noisy, how noisy it is day and night. In New York, <laughs> New York never sleeps. There's activity going on 24-7. There were cars honking, taxi cabs squealing around corners, sirens wailing, and it was almost deafening, all of the noise in the city. Then all of a sudden, the Native American says to his friend, I hear a cricket. And his friend says, what? I, 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 I hear a cricket. You've got to be joking. I mean, you're crazy. You hear a cricket in the middle of Times Square, in the middle of rush hour? You hear a cricket? That's impossible. No. No, I hear a cricket. And then he listens. He listens. And then he crosses over the street. And he sees a cement pot. That's almost a cement pot. <laughs> and it has bushes and flowers. And he starts looking in. He starts looking in. And lo and behold, he finds a little bitty cricket. His friend says, how in the world did you do that? You must have superhuman hearing. That's amazing. That's amazing. I could never, never do that. How did you do it? Then the Native American says, you know, my ears aren't any different than your ears. It all depends what you're listening for. And then his friend says, I could never, never hear a cricket and all this noise. Yes, it's true. You could if you tuned in to hearing a cricket. I'm going to illustrate something for you. And then the Native American reaches in his pocket. <laughs> He takes some coins, quarters, dollars, half a dollars, and he throws them on the floor. And you can hear the coin dropping on the cement floor in New York City. And 20 feet around him, people's heads. What's that tinkle of money on the cement floor? And people started looking. People started looking. Where's that money coming from? Because they thought that maybe there was an opportunity. And then the Indian said, see what I mean? It all depends what you're listening for. So it is with the Holy Spirit and with the will of God. God wants so desperately 
to communicate His will, His love, His truth to you. All we have to do is tune in, surrender, embrace His truth, because His truth will give you eternal life. What do you say? You want to tune in? I want to tune in and surrender and follow His will.